Thank you so much. Uh, we are really excited to be here in Little Rock at uh, the center and really want to have a little fun. So uh, I'm going to be refereeing between these two. Um, and who knows, we'll, we'll have to arm wrestle, whatever. So I'm Rod Bigelow. I'm an executive director and chief diversity and inclusion officer at Crystal Bridges. And um, tonight we're going to talk about Georgia O'Keeffe and her influence uh, and her conveyance on contemporary artists as it relates to our exhibition here uh, in Crystal Bridges that opened just a couple weeks ago. So um, we're going to have time for questions and answers. There's a little advertisement. Uh, here's another advertisement. <laughs> um, so I want to just take a, a moment to introduce our two uh, conversationalists here tonight. Uh, first, Dr. Ann um, Prentice Wagner, who is the curator of drawing at the Arkansas Arts Center and previously with the Smithsonian American Art Museum in DC. Dr. Wagner wrote her dissertation on George O'Keefe, so she knows a tiny little bit about it. Uh, and she said, don't get her started. So we are getting you started. Um, so we'll have, to, we'll have to work on that. But um, um, Dr. Wagner was uh, awarded a Georgia O'Keeffe Museum Research Center Visiting Scholarship and is a frequent lecturer around the country about O'Keeffe. And we're really fortunate to have her with us to talk more about it tonight. So thank you for being here. <clears throat> And then on my right is Stace Treat. He is uh, interpretation manager at Crystal Bridges. He's an integral part of creating the exhibition at Crystal Bridges. He was a professor of media and culture at Drake University at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and at the University of Arkansas before coming to the museum. So he's got lots of experience working with students. Uh, he's going on his third year. It seems like so many more. Um, <laughs> of work and he does a, a ton of research and writing and helps um, all of our audience really connect with the conversations that we're having at the museum. So welcome Stace, thanks. <clears throat> I just have to give one pitch. Stace is uh, the host of our new podcast at Crystal Bridges that's called Museum Way. Uh, open up your phones and uh, link to that podcast. It's really cool. We're on our fourth edition. And he's uh, what I call the Martha Stewart of the museum world. <laughs> so check it out. So we're going to start with Dr. Wagner. Um, so let's talk about George O'Keefe. Okay? Uh, already? You'll get, you'll get me started. I know. And, I've, uh, actually, I have the have clicker. Our, do Sorry. we have our clicker? <laughs> Here you yeah, go. Let's... So tell me... Um, when you're thinking about this exhibition, it's really interesting and there. putting O'Keefe in a bit of a different space. So I would love to hear maybe your comments and thoughts around. You haven't seen the show yet. No, so I haven't full disclaimer. Had a to yet. She hasn't seen the catalog yet. Just so, I've glanced through it just a little bit. So she knows what's the con what the content is the show of the show is. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about it? Well, I, I t uh, some of the uh, images here really play into some of my favorite aspects of O'Keefe. So I. There we go. First wanted to point out that the idea of O'Keefe being a really major figure, um, setting a, an example, being an inspiration for particularly other women artists is not new. This is a photographic collage that was put together by Mary Beth Adelson in 1972. It shows O'Keefe in uh, her face set into Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper as uh, the figure of Christ, and she's surrounded by some of the other great women artists of her day, including, oh, um, let's see, I've got, a, I've got a list of some of them, uh, Linda Menglis, uh, Helen Frankenthaler, June Wayne, Alma Thomas, Lee Krasner, Nancy Graves, Elaine de Cooney, et cetera, um, uh, Louise Nevelson people that we do, I hope, know most of those today, and surrounded by many, many more who have come and gone. Clearly, when you look at the young artists who are coming up, who are featured at Crystal Bridges now, we could certainly do another version of this with a whole new cast of characters um, around and following O'Keefe, and somebody else will probably take the center spot one of these days. But O'Keefe does continue to be really, really special. Um, she 
at the time when this country was first becoming a leader in modern art, and even when the Europeans hadn't really started to notice us, she was one of the first people to prove that to be great as an artistic leader, you didn't have to be a man. Sorry, sorry guys. <laughs> Come on, can we, can we get... Uh, what? Where, where do I need to point this? Do we know? You're good. That's the reveal. Oh, okay. It's a slow There's, reveal. <laughs> just wanted to talk about some of our favorites. Of course, this is one of the most famous of O'Keeffe's images, Jimson Weed, and it's also one of the most famous that happens to be in this show and in the Crystal Bridges collection. And um, I think it sums up a lot of what she did. O'Keeffe is always based in nature, even when it looks totally non-representational. It's always based in nature, but no matter how naturalistic she gets, it's always abstracted. She's always bringing in gesture and geometry and purifying forms and bringing out the motion of her own hand, making the work so that you are aware of the artist at work. So when you look at something like this, can, will my pointer work? But you can see there are no bug holes. There we go. Yeah, it's just a matter of having that good strong finger on there. There are no bug holes. It's very um, symmetrical. It's very flowing. It's very perfect and very elegant. So she's bringing out the strongest feeling of that radial symmetry um, in the flower and just the, the elegance of the natural form. So it's got both sides there. It's definitely abstracted, but it's definitely rooted in nature. And those are the strengths that she always plays off. So it's always her form, it's always her interpretation of it, but she always gets it from where she is in the world. And I love the fact that this show includes some of the really early works. My dissertation was on her drawings from 1915. Um, when she was first making herself into a modernist and she was trying to figure out what was she going to do with form, what she, was she going to do with color, what was she going to look at. She had seen a lot of the works at Alfred Stieglitz's 291 Gallery in New York back during the teens as she was studying at uh, Teachers College at Columbia University. And she, so she knew what some of her ideals of modernism were, but she wanted to find what was going to be hers. And place is going to be something that we're going to be talking about. And um, so she had been studying in New York, but she went off to teach in Texas. And she said, actually, of Texas, uh, that was where she fell in love with the Southwest. You always hear about the New Mexico connection. But she said, that was my country. Terrible winds and a wonderful emptiness. She just loved the scale of the thing. So this figure here, a uh, woman with blue shawl was actually inspired by some of the people of Mexican descent in Texas. And so the colors, the purples and the pinks and the blues, uh, those are some of the colors that would become very important for O'Keeffe. And, but also the simplification of the swirl of that drapery. And then the series one, number one on the right, probably done in New York when she had, become, had fallen ill and um, Alfred Stieglitz had asked her to come back where she, he could take care of her in New York. And um, so have left Texas. So she's doing something that looks very, very abstract, but she certainly is thinking about things like figures and like flowers and like all the natural things she's seen. She's finding her way. She's finding her forms. So this is the type of curve and gesture that's going to continue throughout her work. So we've got some of the really ancestral things. And then of course she's so famous for her flowers, the big flowers, the flowers that made people look and notice what could be such a small thing in life, a little thing by the side of the road, a little thing down in the grass. She would pick it up and paint it really large like these jonquils. And you'll see again, they're simplified, beautified forms. She really brings out the radial symmetry and they're absolutely gorgeous. And then, but it's definitely based on real flowers. But then the abstraction, blue, is even earlier. And it's incredibly abstract. But if you look at those lines, those 
wavy lines and the loops and the symmetry of the thing, it could be based on river forms, it could be based on flowers. It absolutely has a feel of being of this world, being of nature, but pulling it out so that you see those lines on their own. So this is the same kind of thing that I think a lot of other artists will take up. What are the things in nature you're looking at, but also what are your aspects, your um, way of, uh, Making it, making it your own, making it your own statement and finding the, the human and the abstract about it. So this is definitely some of my favorites. And here's one of the contemporary artists, Louis Hollowell. And I think it's the type of abstract symmetry that she's finding in the landscape is the same kind of thing that O'Keeffe loved to find in the landscape and in flowers. So it's just gorgeous to see how these things continue with artists today. And so Stace will be able to talk about that kind of thing in a whole lot more detail. So, so those are so some of the things we'll be looking for. That's great. So uh, you mentioned Sense of Places was so important to O'Keeffe and really um, thinking about that, whether it's uh, in sort of in the desert or in the city or even in her flowers and still lives. Talk, talk about that a little bit. And there's some great things in the show that um, bring out those ideas as well. And of course, we all think about O'Keeffe, we tend to with New Mexico. She first went out to New Mexico to visit her friend um, Mabel Dodge Luhan, whom she had known as Mabel Dodge in New York, who had a, a place that you can, by the way, still visit pretty much unchanged in Taos, New Mexico. So this was where a lot of the artists and the writers went and met. So 1929, she, O'Keefe first went there. Um, she was really kind of trying to escape, I think, some of the East Coast and the fact that at that point she's married to Stieglitz. Stieglitz is very much in charge. She's surrounded by his family, his friends, his followers. She wants a place where she can be herself. And she really finds it out in New Mexico. And, uh, but the first place that she fell in love was with the Southwest was, was Texas. But this is actually, this picture is from her um, house that she originally rented and later bought um, at Ghost Ranch, a dude ranch, um, out in the open spaces in New Mexico. It was a very, very wild place. So this is a very natural, realistic form. But this one looks much more abstracted, but it's also rooted in nature. This was when she was first out teaching in Texas. Actually, it was the second time she was teaching there, but it was a few years after the first time. And um, she would go out with her uh, younger sister, Claudia, and uh, O'Keefe was teaching at college at this point, and, but she was out in the Texas Panhandle. If you've been in the Texas Panhandle, you may know that there's a very great deal of nothing. It's incredibly open, but of course, what's really that means is it's the sky, the incredible, incredible sky. And um, O'Keefe really fell for it, and she noticed that when they would walk out across the plains out there, that her sister would be throwing up glass bottles in the air and shooting them with a shotgun, but O'Keefe was looking at the evening star. So, you know, while the glass is shattering, O'Keefe is looking at the evening star, and it was just, if you try to paint it, it looks like it's just this little dot. It doesn't look important. You don't feel the importance of it. Um, so she tried to figure out abstract ways to show you the importance of it. And so she kept creating watercolor rings around it and playing with color so that you would feel the kind of reverence and strength and beauty that she found in this little speck of light as the sunset was going on the enormous Texas plains. So that is the basis of Evening Star. And I, I, I love this, one of these um, quotes that she has. She wrote to Stieglitz in um, 1916. Uh, talking about why she loved a place like that. And she had, uh, she'd done a little bit of traveling, and she says, it seems so funny that a week ago it was the mountains I thought the most wonderful, and today it's the plains. I guess the feeling of bigness in both that, it, that just carries me away. The plains send you greetings. Big is what comes after living. 
If there is anything, it must be big. And these planes are the biggest thing I know. And she writes, at the same time, she writes to her friend Anita Politzer in New York, um, who'd been to school with her, and she says, I'm loving the planes more than ever, it seems. The sky, all capital letters. Anita, you have never seen sky. It is wonderful. And she does painting after painting after painting about the sky. And it's the, the majesty of the American openness. She just adored it. And it's, it's, she said also, when she was writing later on from New Mexico, she said, I never feel at home in the East like I do out here. I feel like myself, and I like it. But she did know the East as well. And of course, when she was first discovered by um, Alfred Stieglitz, the great photographer and modern art dealer and promoter, um, it was to New York that she came. It was in New York that she studied. Um, she did this fabulous radiator building painting, which is now in the Fisk collection that alternates back and forth at Crystal Bridges. So it shows you the radiator building, one of the magnificent skyscrapers in New York. You know, something that somebody, she was actually from Wisconsin, so somebody who's from smaller places was just really stunned by, and she snuck Stieglitz's name over here, I, I don't think you could necessarily read it, but it's as if there is a, a, an advertising sign, a neon sign of Stieglitz. And then this is a, another very specific kind of a place picture. This is the East River from the Shelton Hotel. Anybody know the association with the Shelton Hotel? That's where she lived with Stieglitz. So that would be when they were at home. That's the view from home. That's the view looking down on the harbor and seeing the ships come and go and seeing the uh, warehouses and the factories and the smoke and all these things that were so different from the wild, so different from where she was from or where she liked to go in the summers out west. So it, she felt the challenge of being able to capture the majesty of the American skyscraper that all the Europeans would come over and just be knocked dead by. It was what made America so different from, you, from Europe. And she felt that the men would get mad at her because they couldn't capture it, but she could. She loved that. She loved to rub their noses on it. And the place that Stieglitz took her when he wanted to get away was Lake George. His family had a home there, so his mother would be there and his brothers and sisters and um, their siblings and the people she was dating, they were dating and so on. Like uh, Stieglitz's sister at one point dated um, Enrico Caruso, the greatest opera singer of the day. <laughs> so it was, it was quite the place. And so, no, it's, it's a beautiful place in New York State. So she had a lot of enjoyment out of getting to know the trees and the flowers. And uh, these are some of the early works that she did when she was first getting to know the family and kind of making her own place out there. A lot of the flowers that we come to associate with her later, I think she saw in the woods around Lake George. There are others like the Jemison weed that she saw in New Mexico. So place with the flowers, for her at least, is still important. We may not always know. Uh, this old maple would have been something very specific that she knew. But then she would be, in the summers, kind of alternating back and forth, she'd be going out to New Mexico. And eventually she started renting places at dude ranches, and eventually she bought a house out there, a place called Ghost Ranch. But in 1931, she said, I, she just didn't want to go back east. Um, she said, I'm ready to go back east as long as I have to go sometime. If it were not for the Stieglitz call, I would probably never go, but that is strong, so I'm on the way. You know, they were married by then, she had to go back east to see Stieglitz, and as she said, he would never be very far from a doctor. But um, what she did was, in 1931, she saw a bunch of bones out on the desert, and she associated those bones with the experience of the desert and the animals that lived and died there. And so she packed up a couple of barrels of bones. And she also, as it happens, picked up some um, <clears throat> petrified shells outside Taos and took those back. And she also picked up 
some artificial flowers that some of the people of uh, Mexican heritage in, in uh, New Mexico would sell on the streets. So she brought all this back to New York and actually made paintings like this, and this is a pastel drawing that's in our collection at the Art Center, made these in New York, but when she's definitely thinking about New Mexico. So this is a horse skull with one of the artificial flowers, and I think uh, she was always kind of upset that people would get, would just be thinking about death. She really saw life in the forms. It's funny though, I, I love the, there's a little note that she wrote to Stieglitz. I'm sending some things. She said, don't open my packages before I get there. Uh, there's nothing in there that would interest you. <laughs> so definitely seeing, you know, this is hers. This is from her place. It's nothing, nowhere he went. I think she kind of resented the fact that he never wanted to go out there with her. And then this one, it's actually, she had picked up um, petrified shells from the time when New Mexico had been underwater, as she said, probably millions of years old. And she put the color of the flowers, she'd been painting these giant flowers since the 20s, since 1924, she started to put color like from the flowers into these mostly white petrified shell forms. Um, this piece, by the way, was pretty much lost to view for decades. It was known only by a 1931 black and white photograph by Stieglitz. But it happened to go into a private collection in Arkansas and was left to us in 2012. So it has reappeared on the scene. And these are some other examples of how she would associate bones and horns and this... <laughs> It's a backbone, you'll see that actually, this bone turns up in a lot of drawings, and she would associate it in these slightly later paintings with the landscape itself that they had come out of. So she would have them almost flying through the air. Sometimes you're looking through gaps. Um, in this case, it looks like we're dealing with a deer with six antlers. I think she's just laying extra sets of antlers under it but it gives you a feeling for the scale of the thing, and the paintings are getting larger and larger. Um, it's, it was something that meant a great deal. I, to her, as to many artists, including the writers at this time, um, it wasn't j place wasn't just a physical thing, it was a spiritual thing. It was a, um, an emotional tie. Uh, D.H. Lawrence said that Americans should work at home. He said, all creative art must rise out of a specific soil and flicker with a spirit of place. So I think O'Keefe was definitely doing that. And place could get very specific. This is the doorway, and this is a photograph of it, that is in the courtyard in her home in Abiquiu. And if you're lucky enough to be able to go out there and arrange a tour, you can see that door. Sometimes in her paintings, you'll see the stepping stones along there. I shall include various amounts of it and do it from various points of view. But it's something she would have seen every day and she would have known incredibly well. And you can see that if you haven't been there and you haven't seen it, you could take it for being very abstract just very simple forms and colors, but they're very powerful, and at least for me, I don't know, maybe I'm constructing backward, having been there and having seen the art, you can feel what it means to her. She's expressing, this is mine, this is my place, I know this, and she's showing it to you. She's sh sharing it with you. Okay, so I could listen to you talk about O'Keefe okay for hours. Um, and I really, my question at the end is going to be what you don't know about O'Keefe, so get ready for that question. Um, but I think this is, this is a departure. You showed us one of the contemporary uh, works in our exhibition, and this is uh, an artist that's also, that you know well, that's in the Arkansas Arts Center's collection, but is also in the exhibition on view. So tell us about this work and this artist. Uh, Mark Lewis has shown in our uh, Delta exhibition, which is our local competitive, regional competitive exhibition, that all the artists in it have to be either from or working in Arkansas or one of the surrounding states. Of course, that sets up a very large region, and very important one, and it happens to include Oklahoma. And Mark Lewis is from Tulsa, and he has actually won the grand award 
in our Delta show, and the awards are given out by a different juror every year. So he's won it twice. So that's not a bad thing to have accomplished. He's not in it this year, but the Delta is on the walls, and I think it's the best, the best Delta I've ever seen. They get better all the time. And this is the type of thing we're used to seeing from him, the self-portrait. You know, you get to see him, but in this case, I, it's very different from O'Keefe in many ways, but it's a very specific place. He tends to do these places that are in Tulsa, and they tend to be along the side of the road. In this case, uh, Peoria Avenue. He's done a number of these of Peoria Avenue, and including has shown some of those in the Delta. And these are collages. But the thing that you may not know from seeing it on the wall this way is these are enormous. You feel like you can walk into them and be enveloped in the scale of that sky and that sign and the buildings like you're there. And because of things being cut into pieces as the collage and built up in layers, there's a vibrancy about it. It's very different. I know Keith didn't do... Um, signs very often, although remember the Stieglitz at the radiator building, um, but she made you feel the bigness of the place and both the familiarity with it and the universality of it. And I think he does that as well. And also, whether or not you've been to Tulsa and maybe stopped at some of these shops along the side of the road, if you have driven on highways across this road, this country, major highways in particular, and stopped, you feel like you've been there. <laughs> you feel like you know, the same kinds of signs and the same kinds of buildings are all the way across the country and that, like, you know, we all will know what the hotels are and the restaurants and so on, the fast food joints and stuff. So he makes you feel that connection. Yeah, it's a, it's a really amazing, it does invite you in, it pulls you into the image. And I, I just want to step back for one second and, and uh, notice that uh, this wonderful work was given to the Arkansas Art uh, Center by the Finches, who are with us this evening. So thank you for that wonderful <laughs> gift. <Yeah. clears throat> yeah. Self-portraiture, which I, for me, I used to work at the National Portrait, uh, Portrait Gallery. Self-portraiture is very, very special at the Art Center, and it's one of the great central themes in the whole history of Western art, and self-portraiture is very, very special to the Finches. So we thank them so much for bringing that whole area to us. And I think that's exactly the same case as Crystal Bridges. So we value that perspective of an artist doing, uh, creating an image of themselves. Uh, it just speaks so much to their soul. So we're going to switch to you, Stace. Hello. And this is on. Okay. It's on. You're good. So uh, we've had a quick review of uh, O'Keefe. Let's talk about the contemporary artists. There are 20 in the exhibition. So yes. how did this happen? And kind of give us a feel of it. Okay. So the two people that you see on the screen right there are the actually the two co-curators of this exhibition. Uh, Chad Allegood there to the left and Lauren Haynes uh, to the right. Uh, some of you uh, may, may know Chad Allegood or remember him. He used to uh, be a curator for us. He's now an independent curator. Um, and Lauren Haynes, uh, she was the curator, uh, our local curator for Soul of a Nation. So. Um, they, there was a time uh, where they overlapped. They were both together at Crystal Bridges. Um, and one of the uh, big pushes at Crystal Bridges that we're um, undertaking now is to actually cultivate our own exhibitions. I actually work in the exhibitions department. And so um, we want to create our own and we want to travel. This man has made it very important for us. And so the next three big exhibitions that we have this is our first, uh, we'll actually be traveling as well. So uh, that, uh, that was very important. So uh, Chad and Lauren came up with this interesting idea. And I don't know that this has been done very often before. Uh, what do you do if you take, what would happen if you took an iconic artist, in this case, Georgia O'Keeffe, and you paired her or you put her in conversation with contemporary and emerging artists that are working today? what would happen? What would that do for the original iconic um, artist? Um, and what would that do for uh, some of the artists that maybe we haven't heard from before? Our theory and our thesis was, they'll come for O'Keeffe, 
but they will leave with new favorite artists, new discoveries. And I think that's what's going on. So these two decided, okay, uh, we're going to collect some um, um, you know, important works by O'Keefe. And of course, in our collection, also in combination with uh, um, the uh, Alfred Stieglitz collection that we co-own with um, Fisk, uh, we actually have a pretty good collection of O'Keefe works and some important ones. And so uh, we put ours together, um, and then Chad and Lauren started looking around and seeing what can we get from other places, what are some good ones. And so we've been able to amass about 35 uh, key artworks, many that um, Anne showed you here tonight, um, uh, for this collection. So rather than go, here's O'Keefe, here's contemporary art, what they decided to do was put them together. Well, how do you do that exactly? And also, how do you pick 20 contemporary artists, for one thing? Where do you go? How do you find them? All of that kind of stuff. Well, that's kind of their job as, con as contemporary artists they're, or, or curators. They're always in conversation and they're always on the look for uh, what's going on in the art world. And, and not just in the big centers, but in all the different uh, communities as well. So let's look at some of the artists that they found. Do I just hit this button here, Ron? Yeah. Okay. I should say also that what they did was they uh, came up with some themes. Uh, Georgia O'Keeffe was known for, which uh, Anne has, has illustrated very beautifully with the examples that she chose, different kinds of themes in her work throughout her career. Uh, this woman died at the age of 99, but she painted for about, what, 70 years, Anne? Would you say? Well, she started as a child. She, she started as a child, and so more than that, yeah, <laughs> yeah, she was, yeah, she was ninety-eight. She was almost ninety-nine. Okay, well, she uh, she uh, has a long body of work, and so um, what she's kind of best known for are her flower paintings, her abstractions, still life paintings, of course, uh, paintings of cities and deserts, um, and uh, also. Uh, the figures that you saw, the, the, the watercolor with the figure, she actually didn't paint a lot of people. She wasn't that interested in painting people. But we thought it was an interesting um, absence. And so uh, we, uh, the curators put together these themes and thought I'm, they wanted to go out and find artists that are doing really interesting and innovative work today around those same themes. And so that's how they've, we've structured the exhibition. This artist um, on the left, Wardell Milan, uh, he paints several different kinds of things. In fact, we've got uh, five pieces from this young man who is based in New York City. Um, this is a, a, from a tulip series. We've got three of these flower paintings and we put them, uh, pair them with Jimson Weed, the Jonquil paintings, and a Petunias painting from O'Keeffe. Uh, and then the artist you see there on the right, Louise Jones, she's a Detroit-based muralist. Um, and I don't know if you all can recognize, those of you that have been here, uh, this is in a very specific part of the corridor that kind of goes around our, our pond towards our great hall. Uh, she did a site-specific mural right there. It's absolutely beautiful. It's stunning, and we get to keep it for a year, I think. So here's the pitch to actually go see it in person, because <laughs> the slides make no sense when you're actually in front of the work. So the work on the right is about 30 feet tall. It took her about a week to uh, create it on, her, on a lift, painting it. And the work on the left is incredibly vibrant, comes off the canvas, it's beautiful. So you gotta come see these works. Yeah, the artist herself was about this tall. Yeah, she was, she was, <laughs> she was like 4'8", maybe 4'9". She nine. was really small. Uh, um, so this is in our flower section. In our abstraction section, uh, what, what do you think that looks like? I'll just throw this out to you all. What? Flowers? Flowers? Clouds. Clouds. Paint. Someone said paint. Paint. What's that? Smoke. Blood. Ooh. Blood. Ooh, that's good. <laughs> that's dark and awesome. Uh, smoke. Okay, go with it. Yeah. This is paint squirted into an aquarium full of water. Um, by an artist named Kim Kiever, and he used to be a scientist before he was an artist, so he's really interested in these um, uh, chemical reactions that happen. And so he'll squirt different kinds of paint in these different you know, ways and wait for the perfect moment, and then he photographs it um, high res. And so this is actually a photograph. He said if you walk into his room, uh, into his home, it's uh, aquariums the entire length of his entire apartment, filled with water and waiting for those moments. This is another version. This is another photograph. 
and they're oh. actually stunning to sit, to to stand in front of and just sort of study. Um, so Anne, anyway, Anne said, "No fish. There are no fish. <laughs> there are no fish. No Unless fish you were harmed. One. Yeah, no fish were harmed in the making of this art." Uh, this is Loie Hollowell. We've seen this image before. Um, and uh, we actually have two works by, by her in the collection, or in the show. One of the things that uh, is special about this is that this is actually a textured painting. So she actually puts uh, adhe uh, foam, this kind of foam layer that she sculpts and puts on the canvas and then paints over it. And she also mixes sawdust in her paint. So it's got this really cool texture and layer to it that um, when you go up to it, make sure you turn and look kind of at the side of the canvas so you can see those, those, uh, that technique. So again, artists that are doing some really interesting things. And, and Loie Hollowell herself is very interested in the relationship between the human body and the landscape. Um, and so her, uh, she likes to play, that, play with that, that idea. In the still life section, you, uh, we is actually where we have the most O'Keeffe's collected together. We have several together in this um, in this section. But Anna Valdez is a young artist working today, um, who does all these wonderful floral prints and still lifes. Um, and of course, you can see the skull uh, here kind of resonating. And in fact, this hangs right next to the uh, the deer skull pictures that you saw earlier. And what's really great about this is that uh, Anna created a wallpaper that uh, she designed that sits behind this work of art on the entire wall that's vibrant and just contrasts and pushes back and forth between this object and the wall. It's really, really amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, really, really beautiful. Then we get into the cities and deserts um, section, and this is where um, you will see the Mark Lewis um, collage mentioned earlier uh, that hangs really close to the radiator building picture that you saw earlier. Um, and then we have this, this artist named Caroline Larson. Uh, we have three pictures by her, and this is uh, something you have to see in person. This is technically oil on canvas, but the way that she puts the oil on the canvas is through a cake icing bag, and she dollops, dollops it like this. It's very rich, very multi-layered, and she is expressing desert life in a very different way than, than O'Keeffe. <clears throat> Excuse me, this is like Palm, Palm Beach, California, or, or LA, or uh, like high uh, modern living uh, with pools and palm trees and all this kind of stuff. So she's sort of a, um, evoking this really rich, textured, opulent um, life in the desert, um, very different from O'Keeffe's dead bones. Uh, this artist, we have two works by her. Her name is Negar Akami. Uh, she is Iranian-American, um, um, and this is called The Bridge. And if you look to the right of the picture, that structure, does it remind you of anything in particular? The Trade Center. What was it? The Radiator Building. The Radiator Building, yes, and the World Trade Center in particular, yes. This is an artist that, that's based in, in New York and... and uh, uh, is very uh, inspired by her Persian heritage as well. So what she's doing is she's blending elements from Persian um, myth and uh, uh, scenery with um, elements from New York. She was there when the uh, Twin Towers um, fell, and so she does incorporate a lot of imagery from both cultures um, into her work. And there's a little figure up here at the top uh, standing on a bridge right there. Um, uh, and there's also a lot of glitter in her paint, so it's like sparkly and fun. Uh, this is actually Sharona Eliasoff, um, and she does some really, we have three paintings by her in the show as well, um, and she likes to play with this combination of an urban setting with kind of the fantasy of late night show, uh, game shows and every uh, other things. Does this, oops, sorry, does this look familiar to y'all? This pattern, if you put a little Vanna White down here. <laughs> yeah, so she's literally pulling from Wheel of Fortune and blending it with the majesty of the Empire State Building. Um, her, she might have a sense of humor. She does have a sense of humor. And in fact, we put her, uh, a detail of her, one of her paintings on our cover. You'll just have to come and see it. Okay, I wanted, this is, this is, so far, this has been like one of the biggest hits in the show from a, a contemporary artist. Her name is Cynthia Daniel. Her project is fascinating. She started in Chicago. She's a Chicago-based artist. Thank you. Uh, this is prettier than me. Um, 
She's a Chicago-based artist, and she decided one year she was going to take a trip around the country. Started in Chicago and went uh, around the, the kind of the borderland. So she went around the top border, down the west coast, down through uh, the southeast, southwest, and into the southeast, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. She decided every 25 miles she's going to stop and make a painting. Little one, smaller than this, actually, smaller than this book. Uh, here are four kind of images, and so you can see uh, it didn't matter what she stopped to take a picture of, to make a sketch of, or to paint. She was going to do it. And she ended up uh, basically capturing 360 little paintings that she's put all together into this. Ooh, see the ooh factor, Rod? Yeah. Well, so this, this really talks to the same concept uh, that Anne talked about, sense of place. Because every 25 miles, it didn't matter where that 25-mile marker was, she stopped and made a painting. So how does that, that relationship between sense of place is a really interesting one. Yeah, she kind of, uh, it's described in here as it's a love letter to the United States because she wanted to capture this, the rich diversity of it through the landscape. You won't see any figures in it, but you will see buffalo, you will see factories, you'll see barns, you'll see water, river, lakes, streams, cactuses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's just a, a wonderful uh, thing to kind of fall into and, I mean, and enjoy. And that's the artist um, there. Uh, the, you don't want to fall into it. It's no. against the rules. <laughs> <laughs> don't literally. Um, but yeah, so this was the first time that this work was hung. The way that, that she kind of um, allows her work to be done is it, it can be hung in any different way that, that the, the gallery or the museum would choose. And so there have been um, installations where, like if it were in this room, it would start back there and maybe three or four paintings deep and just go all the way and wrap around the room. And so that's one way you can experience it. Just it just must be sequential. <clears throat> That was a rule. There's got to be a sequence to it. And we do have a sequence. I'll tell you the secret. It starts on one corner up here, goes down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up. Um, and I'd love to know if you all can figure out which cities that she's portraying. There's two or three cities that are in there. I think one of them's Detroit, but I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, that's a really uh, exciting work. And, and again, couldn't be further in some ways from what um, O'Keefe's style and form is, but man, it's a really interesting homage to the idea of landscape and place, isn't it? There she is, Cynthia. So uh, this is uh, the, ty the this is uh, one of O'Keeffe's late, late works and is uh, the namesake of the exhibition. And I, I just, as one of her last works, um, I really would love to have you reflect on you know, how does this reflect the rest of the show? How does this reflect on the artists that were chosen and selected and how, how that dialogue continues with, with this being the iconic work? So um, I just wanted to verify and show you that the, the, the definition edges. Uh, it comes down to about, see this little line right here? So it's that. And, and maybe you can talk a little bit about um, what her so-called horizon pictures were. Do you know much about the Horizon pictures towards the end of her life? Well, I know that there were ones that she was doing where uh, she was, as she was going blind. Yes. That that was still the division that she could see, mm -hmm. that she could perceive. I, I don't know the re whether the reason she went blind was that she refused to wear sunglasses and, and uh New Mexico, this is not a great idea, mm -hmm. but you know, she was willing, she wanted to see the truth. She wanted to see the light the way it was. She wanted to see the color the way it was. And at the very end of her life, she was losing that. So this would be the last thing she could grab onto. And she did keep making some in that direction with assistance mm -hmm. later on. But this, is, this one is done entirely by herself. But she's also, she was looking back in her late years, she was looking back to some of her earliest pieces when she had been looking at the sky um, out in Texas and in uh, uh, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. And I think there's some from an early trip to Colorado and, and various places. It was always magic to her. And another thing that she, later on in their life, she did a lot of flying. So mm -hmm. she got really interested in the sky from higher up. Mm -hmm. And um, there were whole series, I mean, famously, of the clouds that she's looking down on. That, mm -hmm. you know, there's an enormous one 
in, uh, at the Art Institute of Chicago, which the size of it was dictated by the size of her garage. <laughs> it was the size that she could get, that she could get inside. But uh, so there are all these kind of universal themes mm-hmm. going. But yeah, talk more about this specific one. Well, yeah, this, uh, so uh, with, when, the, when we were conceiving the exhibition and talking about which works we were going to use and how we were going to do it, um, this work kept kind of coming back to us because uh, this is the last painting that she um, made unassisted. So it was the last sort of singular work by her um, without help. Um, and it is a horizon picture. We actually have two um, in, the, in the very last gallery. Uh, the second one is a later one from 1976 that was an assisted painting, and it's very different. It's bigger and it's brighter. But there was something kind of, um, I think, philosophical and meditative in some way about, um, number one, there are several things. First of all, the idea that one of the greatest American artists is actually going blind late in life. It was macular degeneration, I believe, was what was causing it. Um, and so she painted this painting um, out of her, using her peripheral vision. Um, and it, again, it goes back to what um, Anne started speaking about from the very beginning was the sky, right? The big, huge sky. And that was, she's still painting that at the end of her life, at the end of her career. She's still painting it, but she's going up higher into it. Um, and then here we are, what, 30 years, 40 years after she passes away in 19, uh, eight, 1987, six, six. Uh, 1986. Um, that we are introducing people to a lot of artists that are still doing work along the same vein as Georgia O'Keeffe. So in some ways it's like we're bringing everyone beyond O'Keeffe um, into the contemporary moment um, and, and kind of leaving everyone with this idea of um, what it means to be a legacy, to have a legacy, what it means to be iconic, what does it mean to be unknown. So show us, show us one of the artists that are, you know, this artist here. Okay, this is a work called Eclipse. It's not in our show, but he did a site-specific work for us. Um, and the, I think it's the youngest artist in the exhibition, and here he is. His name is Dylan Gebbia Richards. This is right as you exit. So you've just spent some time with uh, Georgia O'Keeffe's Horizon Pictures, The Beyond. Also, by the way, in that room, you have an opportunity to go digitally to the ghost ranch and to the desert and to actually do a 360 touch video experience where you can walk around you can literally walk around her ghost ranch house and abiquiu and see the desert that inspired her and so that's a a virtual experience that you can have while you're in the room with uh, her last paintings and then you exit through this amazing um, sculpture that is completely uh, enveloping but it's it's three-dimensional and it again the photo doesn't support the actual experience it looks like coral or plastic or you know this depth that exists cave like yeah. cloud like it's lots of cool. pictures or lots of colors um, and his his <clears throat> purpose is to really um, he wants his work to surround and envelop the the uh, the um, the visitor the viewer the guest and to yeah. to um, like really experience it and so we th- that's just kind of uh, we felt like as a perfect ending um, for the show as you leave the exhibition so I just uh, want to circle around, thank you, Stace, circle around to what Stace said in the beginning was about discovering these uh, contemporary artists along with sort of looking more deeply at O'Keeffe and, and talking about the Arkansas Democrat Gazette uh, had an uh, editorial, which this is, that said, it's like going to a big budget movie built around a stellar performance by a Hollywood superstar and discovering that the supporting cast is in itself worth the price price of admission. So these artists that are doing incredible work um, are really important to see. And while I'm talking about stellar performances, I'd really like to thank and recognize Helen Porter, who is here with us this evening. She um, uh, was able to help um, support this. She's the lead supporter for the Beyond. So thank you, Helen, for being part of um, this journey with us. We really appreciate that. And uh, Helen was able to help us create this wonderful um, exhibition book that covers all the O'Keeffe's in the show as well as the contemporary artists. So it's, it's a wonderful documentation of um, their experience here. 
So, oh, and Anne, we wanted to leave a moment for you to talk about an O'Keefe work that's currently on view at the Arkansas Art Center. Thank you very much, because yes, we have a, a, gal a little gallery that is devoted to O'Keefe and a lot of the other Stieglitz Circle artists and people of that period. And it just so happens that we have a different place that you don't normally think of O'Keefe with on the wall. One of her drawings that she made in Bermuda there were a couple of very cold winters when she just felt she could not stick it out at Lake George while you now it's covered with snow and she was not feeling well and so she went to visit friends in Bermuda, wouldn't you? And so she was not up to painting when she was there but she was on the second trip up to drawing and so this is one of a whole series of uh, drawings she did about banana flowers, and she has a wonderful uh, quote that's on our on our wall. So this you can you can go and uh, see this fabulous drawing here, right here in Little Rock, and then you can go out to Crystal Bridges and see lots and lots more. Great. So thank you for joining us this evening. We have a few minutes for questions. If you have questions, I'm going to make one of these to answer it. Go ahead. <laughs> Since you studied Georgia O'Keeffe in her early years, uh, as group of as part of that group of American modernists, uh, the exhibition at the Arkansas Art Center includes Marin, and their idea was a response to um, this utopian industrialization that had come along. He continued with that. She then isolated herself gradually in her career and began early and then eventually ended up in Abiquiu. Could you kind of uh, talk a little bit about how different their responses were to that movement? It is kind of interesting because, yeah, O'Keeffe um, did spend a little time in Maine, and she did love the ocean, but she didn't respond to it at all the way John Marin did. Um, she was much more, I think, about more eternal shapes, and he was much more about uh, motion and uh, the motion of the waves and the motion of um, oh, motion of figures, the implied motion in buildings. Um, so he was constantly going back and forth between the city and more and more remote parts of Maine. If you look at the map of where he would spend his summers, it goes marching up the coast of Maine. I, I did a trip a couple of years ago following that path, and you could tell that it's getting more and more remote. Whereas O'Keefe was went directly out to a place that was very remote, and I think she was really looking for things that were universal and often, other than the light coming and going, unchanging. And part of it was she did get to be, I think, much more of a celebrity, partially because she lived a lot a lot longer. She was born later than Marin, and she lived a lot longer and went into much more of a media era. And um, I don't, I, w I wish I could have known her when she was an enthusiastic young woman. When you read her letters, she was so enthusiastic and she was so excited about what she was doing and what, what other people were doing, what she could learn about. But at the end of her life, she just wanted to work. She just wanted to be alone and paint and see her friends and listen to music and enjoy the beauty of New Mexico. There's a story so that puts across, I think, how cynical she had become and what a big star she'd gotten to be. There was somebody who came up to her, went up to her gate, I guess, and said, oh, gee, I've always wanted to see you. And O'Keefe faced her and said, front view, side view, <laughs> rear view, and walked back to the house. Because she'd just been seen and harassed so much she just wanted to paint. And of course, you're, you know, your life changes. Um, and in response to the uh, people Know, who love your work, um, you, things can't stay still. They can't stay the same. You can't, you can't isolate yourself when you're that famous. She was a multimillionaire by the time she died. Actually, it also makes me think of another guy who loved Maine, uh, Winslow Homer. He was not really a um, mean, crotchety old guy, but he did have signs that said, and I've got one on my, on my door that I took when I was at, or that I copied actually out of a book that shows his studio. But uh, it shows snakes, snakes, mice, mice, and he would put these out to keep ladies away because he just wanted to paint. But he was the most famous, you know, 100 years ago. He was the most, more than 100 years ago now, he was the most famous artist in America, and it's something you gotta deal with. Yes, sir, wait, uh, if you could wait for a mic, that'd be great. I wanted to ask you about 
a little bit more about her time in Canyon, Texas. I visited oh, there yes. and went out to visit Palo Duro Canyon. Oh, it's And so I was gorgeous. stunned by how much, to me, it reminded me of northern New Mexico, Ghost Ranch, where she ended up. In a way, do you think that affected her, branded her, directed her to northern New Mexico, that initial experience? It definitely has a lot in common with it. Yeah, I've been to both places, and it's interesting, because I think a lot of people look at her paintings and they think, oh gosh, she's really messed with the color, that's really abstract. And then you go to the real place, and you realize how much color there is in both places, as you said. I, in Palo Duro, I was lucky enough to go and um, stay there for uh, a day and overnight um, at the very end of March in uh, 2003, when the desert was starting to bloom. So in addition to what was in the rocks and the sky, there, was, there were also all these flowers that were blooming. And it was just incredible. And yeah, I think she found a lot of the same kind of thing there. And, but the interesting thing with that is, as she said, you're going along in the Texas panhandle and it's so big and so flat and so open, nothing, nothing, nothing. And then all of a sudden there's this enormous slit at your feet. So you're going down into the earth and it gets deeper and deeper because it's, you know, it's cut by the, by the river that's down at the bottom. And um, she was fascinated and the original drawings that she made there do survive. They are at the O'Keeffe Museum. They are about like that size. It's a little tiny sketchbook. We now know exactly what day those sketches were made. That's in her, in her letters. And yeah, I think a lot of the same kind of thing of looking up and there's red and there's green and there's white and there's yellow. There are all these colors in the walls and you get the same thing in New Mexico on a much bigger scale. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Uh, you've talked about uh, how these uh, contemporary artists today have been influenced by her, her work, her style, her subject matter, that type of thing. Go back to Georgie O'Keeffe when she was younger. Who influenced her in, like, in the uh, teens? That's, that's an interesting one. One of the most important would be uh, Wassily Kandinsky. Um, somebody that you would, you know, great Russian artist, and he wrote a book that was translated into English as On the Spiritual in Art. It's not actually really a word-for-word -word translation. And it was translated originally and published through Stieglitz, so she knew it. And he talks about paralleling abstract art with music, that there's no reason that music has to portray specific things in nature like bird, bird song or chattering creeks or something that it can be as abstract as it likes and we go right along with it we don't have a problem and he wanted art and color to be the same way interestingly when O'Keeffe was blind at the end of her life she still had her copy of On the Spiritual and Art and she had people read it to her it was read into tatters I wanted to see it when I was a visiting scholar there and I couldn't see it because it had just been read to bits anybody else Kandinsky and is the one the Kandinsky and I would say also Dove she had definitely seen Arthur Dove, who became a great friend of hers, one of the Stieglitz Circle artists. We have a lot of doves in our collection. Um, and it's interesting, there are some pieces, especially some very abstracted charcoal drawings that they both did, where there's a bit of a question as to who influenced whom. I think a lot of it was probably mutual. Certainly his general um, abstracted approach to nature, but always nature-based was something she was aware of from very early and would have seen on the walls at 291. But then, of course, once she started showing her things, he wasn't going to ignore them either. Was John Wesley Dow another one? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, she studied with him, but she also studied with one of his followers, Alan Bement, um, when she was uh, studying at the University of Virginia, where she was also actually a teacher. And uh, she, it's, to me, that's one of the nice stories about place, was that she was a teaching assistant to Beeman, and, and so she really got to know Dow's teachings. Uh, if people aren't familiar with Dow, his writing is still in print. You, it's some of the most influential publications from over 100 years ago on the teaching of art, and he was very into not just the physical skill of drawing, but how to design how to divide space in a beautiful way. And um, 
he would give people exercises about how to situate things in squares and rectangles and so on, and it's still a very powerful way of learning, and she was very strongly um, influenced by it. And Dow actually went out west himself and did a lot of paintings and prints of the Grand Canyon and places like that. Terrific. Well, thank you, Anne, and thank you, Stace. Uh, thanks for uh, sharing some time with us. We appreciate it. And thank you, Rod. Thank you. And uh, we'll have more partnerships with uh, Crystal Bridges, so keep looking for it, because we, we like it, and I hope they like it, and that's going to continue. Before you leave, I mean, obviously you can come visit, but just one bit of reminder about the local arts. Thursday at noon, an important program here. It's an update on the rep. So I hope you will come Thursday at noon. Uh, of Arts in Arkansas, we, we, we need you at that program. Thank you all. <laughs>